All right, everyone, today's episode of Heal Thyself. Thank you for joining. This is the newest one. This is going to be a really good one. I say it all the time. Obviously, thank you for supporting the show, doing everything you can. So this is the show you've been waiting for for quite a while. I will be reviewing collagen, all the different types of collagen, ranked from most transparent to the best ones to eh, maybe I'd stay away from them. Um, so I really hope you guys find a lot of value on this show. And then I have an awesome, awesome, awesome guest, a close friend of mine, Dr. Jade, and he is totally a metabolism guru. Anything you ever wanted to know about just overall health and weight loss, weight gain, whatever you're looking for, you got to listen to him. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to go right into it. Let's get to the knowledge bomb. All right, so before we get into the best and worst brands for collagen, I really want you all to understand what collagen is and why people are using it. It's a main structural protein in the body, and it's found all throughout, all different types of areas, and I'll tell you where, mostly, but it's the most abundant protein overall, with 25 to 30% of the body being collagen. You see it most in skin, which is why the beauty industry has gone really hard on the collagen, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, bones, and it gives us structure, so we're not like just a puddle of skin with two eyes on the floor, but it gives our body strength and structure, but also stability and flexibility. So in terms of skin, let's think about a little baby. When you pinch a baby's cheek, and it has that reflex back, right? It's nice and plump and soft. That's collagen, whereas you do it to your grandmother, it's gonna be a little different. That's the difference between collagen deposition in different areas of the body, particularly now we're talking about the skin. So it also has a very important function I just mentioned about stretching. So you see it in ligaments and tendons, right? They're gonna to need to stretch and move, but also be stable. Unfortunately, as we get older, there's different reasons why collagen declines, but as we get older, collagen declines. Um, actually, UV radiation, so lots and lots of sun can change uh, the formation of collagen or the deposition of collagen, which is why you see people who are out in the sun all the time, their skin changing. That's because their collagen is breaking down. We make our own. Most of it is coming from ourselves. Uh, it's coming from our cells, and that's called endogenous collagen, whereas when, and I'll speak about later, exogenous collagen that's coming from like supplements. So there's different types of collagen and you'll see your supplement may advertise that it's a certain type of collagen. Now the types vary, but the major ones are types one, two, and three. Types one is mostly in the skin, the bones, the ligaments, the tendons, right? The teeth, these are densely packed ropes of collagen to provide really strong, strong stability, all right? Whereas type two is cartilage, eyes, that's less loop, less structural and more loosely packed collagen. And then type three is mostly in the intestines and blood vessels. So you'll see that these collagen companies are going to uh, advertise the type of collagen that it uses specific to what it needs to heal. So when it comes to the exogenous collagen, the whole supplement industry, they utilize bovine, poultry, porcine, and marine parts. So depends on the company. Usually some will use a mix of all, some will use just one. But what are the goals of usage, right? So you have to ask yourself, why are you using collagen and if it's gonna work? And that's the big question, does collagen work? So the worry with collagen is that supplementally, uh, it's not fully absorbed in the body. And then the other part is, is that it's not necessarily intended the way we want it to be used. So the analogy I say is sometimes if you take in co collagen and they're giving, you're giving yourself some uh, particular amino acids, which I'll talk about later, the body doesn't care about plumping your skin when it has more important things to do internally. Skin is the last thing to heal when your body is healing. So if you're using collagen for beauty, but your joints are a mess, your intestines are inflamed, I think your body's gonna prioritize those things before your skin. And then you might go, oh, this collagen supplement didn't even work. So that is sort of the controversy behind the collagen industry. But there are some studies that say yes to that and no to that. The studies that, they, that do say yes, they show that over a few months, there has been uh, shown improvements for the intended function. So one is skin. Uh, there is a study that showed that folks had more elastic, hydrated, and youthful appearing skin. Um, there was a study on joint health, and folks had better joint health, improvement of joint health, reduced pain. Uh, but there are also some studies on the other side that say that it doesn't work at all. So what you'll see is on these notes for the show, I provided some citations where you can read some yourself. The bottom line is, is this. If you notice a difference, then listen to your body, right? If you're using collagen and you notice a difference, listen to your body. Don't listen to me. 
If you don't notice a difference, well, maybe there's other things that you need to do, which I'll talk about. If you take collagen peptides, you need to support it in other ways. You can't just depend on the supplement itself. So here are some of my favorite ways to support endogenous, right? Internal collagen production, vitamin C. Vitamin C is so, 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 it's actually top tier important when it comes to collagen, right? It might even be more important than the collagen peptides themselves, right? Because not only does vitamin C stimulate the production of your own endogenous collagen, but it also protects your cells from oxidation. Really cool stuff. Remember I talked about oxidation breaking down collagen. Vitamin C is a cofactor to the enzyme that stabilizes the amino acids that make up collagen also. So it's capital E essential for healthy collagen in the body. Now, if that wasn't enough, vitamin C also promotes the genetic expression of more more collagen, more synthesis of collagen. So when vitamin C is not present, you have less cross-linking, less structure, less stability, decreased total synthesis of collagen. So if you take the collagen peptides, or if you're not, make sure you're getting vitamin C. You gotta get your vitamin C status right. Get your berries, your raspberries, your blueberries, your blackberries, your orange, your grapefruit, lime, lemon, peppers, bell peppers, all different colors, papaya, mango, guava, Get your vitamin C if you want collagen in your body. What else do you want? You want sulfur-rich foods. Sulfur protects collagen from the breakdown in the body, right? It also protects you from oxidation, just like vitamin C. It helps your liver detoxify. So some foods that are high in proline are meat, fish, cabbage, soy, chives, asparagus, watercress, seaweed, beans. Some are high in glycine, are meat, fish, eggs, carob, watercress, again, sesame, sunflower, pumpkin seeds, spinach, carrots, beets and legumes. So make sure you're getting these densely packed amino acid rich foods, some sulfur, some vitamin C. So lastly, some folks say the bone broth can be um, rich in these nutrients, but you got to be vigilant about your bone broth and be aware that uh, when mammals are exposed to um, heavy metals, we build them up in our fat or we build them up in our brain and our nerves and our and, and different organs. But one of the major parts is our bones too. So you have to be vigilant. I don't ever tell people to do bone broth all the time, particularly because there's the risk of heavy metals. Um, so if you're doing it, don't do it regularly, but it can theoretically be a really rich source of these amino acids that I mentioned, plus collagen in itself. So lastly, before I move on to the product review, there's here's a bonus that no one's talking about when it comes to collagen. And I'm gonna give it to you. One of the most powerful collagen stimulators just might be red light therapy. One control trial on the photomedicine and laser journal showed that red light therapy created an increase in collagen production, as well as a noticeable change in feeling in the complexion of the intervention group versus the placebo. We also see benefits in collagen deposition when it comes to the bone and in muscle strength. So if you're looking to optimize collagen and you're really into like anti-aging and cosmetics, might be a really nice intervention to invest in a red light infrared unit that you use all the time. You can use it daily. I've had uh, colleagues of mine use it and say that their skin has really plumped up in a month. Um, so I have one, I just haven't used that in that capacity or for that. I'll give it a try and I'll report back. All right, so there you go. Let's just go into the product review. I know you all wanna know about the best collagens out there and I, wanna, I know you wanna know who was not transparent. So let me help you out. Let's go to the product review. Okay, so for the product review, I'm here to talk about the exogenous collagen industry, right? The supplement industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So aside from supplements, collagen is used medically as a cosmetic filler. We've seen that in, um, in aesthetic medicine. Uh, wound healing and the ER, we, they use it for burns and nasty injuries and cuts. Uh, tissue regeneration, we see that in dentistry a lot of the time and, and oral, as, as well as using, utilizing it for the gum and grafts. And then skin regeneration that's used a lot. So I do not, I'm going to say this before I even jump into the supplements. I don't believe that collagen creams work. I don't think that they get into the skin deep enough. So um, I think they're a hoax. Now collagen peptides is what I'm here to talk about. This is hydrolyzed collagen. So it's supposed to be more absorbable. It's a three plus billion dollar market. It's expected to hit $7 billion in the next six to seven years. It's already saturated. There was a ton of companies that I called up. So I wanted to get in touch with the top companies wanted to see how they source, if they were transparent, 
right, if they were willing to provide information. Um, I also asked the companies about their products and specifically the COA. And if you'll remember, when I did the cacao review, when I did the plant protein powder review, and now this one, I mentioned always the certificate of analysis. This is a third party, um, usually a PDF, a third party PDF that comes that hopefully companies are transparent and willing to provide. A lot of times they're not, which is very much so unfortunate. But what it shows you is all the adulterants, like heavy metals, but it also shows like pesticides um, if, if it reports what it has. So it really shows you an inside look if the product is good. So uh, again, I asked all these companies for certificates and I'll tell you which ones were willing to provide it, which ones didn't. So uh, when it comes to heavy metals, remember I mentioned, animals, animal bones, heavy metals. When I was talking earlier in the Knowledge Bomb segment about bone broth, we wanna make sure that these collagen proteins are not high in heavy metals. Very, very important, particularly because there's no safe levels for many of these heavy, heavy metals, particularly lead. So if you're pregnant and you're using collagen but has really high levels of lead, that might be a problem. And certainly if you decide to give your, your kids some collagen, that might be an issue too. So that's why I did this. So without further ado, here are some of the companies. Let me start off with the companies that I reached out to and they never got back to me. And I reached out to multiple times. I have an assistant. She was really pivotal in reaching these companies too. Both of us called. Um, so when I say I reached out a company, it wasn't just a DM and then goodbye or an email or goodbye or one call or goodbye. I was pretty vigilant and I did not get any call back or any correspondence from Amazing Grass, which is unfortunate because they provide the vegan one, which would be wonderful for all my vegan uh, fellas and, and ladies out there. But Amazing Grass, nothing. Physician's Choice, I waited on a call back. I left a DM, nothing. And it's ironic that it's called Physician's Choice because it's certainly not mine. Bio Schwartz, that's another one. I emailed them, nothing. DM them, nothing. Uh, couldn't get in touch with them. So are these companies good? I don't know. I have no idea. They could be the best ones out there, but if you're not getting in touch with me, then I don't know, all right? So I can't tell you if they're transparent. I can't say if they're not. What I do know is that companies need to be more accommodating um, in this day and age. There were companies that were a lot more receptive and helpful, so I wouldn't even utilize these companies because I don't know. All right, so here's the companies that did get back to me but denied the COA or they said they were gonna send it and never sent it. So Vital Proteins, I know that this is the one y'all wanted to hear about. It's probably the one of the most popular ones out there, but um, I think it is the most popular one. But guess what? It was one of the hardest ones to get in touch with. I DM'd them last week, very specifically on what I was planning on doing, what I was looking for. I told them what I wanted. I gave. I said specifically, I wanna give you an opportunity to show that your company's transparent so I can relay it to the public. Um, they told me to email their marketing team. I emailed their marketing team, no response. I sent another DM. They told me to email another department. I did, no response. I gave them ample time. They never got back in touch with me. So Vital Proteins, I'm sorry, I can't uh, support or I can't promote. Um, and I found better companies than this. So that's what I think about vital proteins. Reservage Collagen Booster by Biocell Technology. They said that they do not provide the COA on the phone. Um, and I gave them more details about what I was doing, but they escalated it to their global sales and marketing manager. Uh, in the context of the sourcing and speaking and clinical trials, they spoke to me about it, all of that. And I was supposed to get an email with more information from them. I never did. I was supposed to get word back on putting together and sending me a COA. I never did. So I don't know which is worse, a company not being available uh, like Vital Nutrients or being available like this but not providing anything. So I'm sorry. I mean, the guy was nice on the phone, but bottom line is I'm looking for the data, man. All right, Ancient Nutrition. This is another really popular one. Dr. Axe, you know, a fellow holistic integrative practitioner. I want to support you, brother. I really do, but um, I can't support your company. Check this out. I reached out by phone two weeks ago, spoke to them, said what I was planning on doing. They said they would get back to me. They never did. So I DM them and then they gave me an email address of very specific people to reach out to. I emailed them. I heard nothing back for six days. I re-emailed them this week. I said, hey, um, I'm doing the show. Did you, did you get my email from six days ago? And then they reached back out uh, and they gave me some details on the brand. They said they utilize non-GMO, pasture-raised, cage-free and cruelty-free sources um, and uh, different animal sources with different types of collagen. But I asked for the COA and they said they'll get right back to me. They'll get it to me uh, in the morning. They were supposed to get it this morning. And I got an email this morning that says, oh, you know, I probably misunderstood, but 
They don't provide the COA. They can give me all, all the information. They said it's proprietary. Let me tell you something about COAs. They are not proprietary, particularly the heavy metals. If you request the heavy metals, that's not proprietary information. Proprietary information is where they're sourcing it from, but most companies that are transparent take that out. I don't need to see where they're sourcing it from. I don't need to see your secret location. What I do need to see is the levels of pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals. That's what I care about. So Ancient Nutrition, Dr. Axe, I'm sorry I can't support you. Garden of Life, I call them up, pretty blatantly denied everything. They said they don't share third-party testing. I mean, I didn't expect it. I wonder to myself if this would have happened if they were not owned by Nestle back in the day. But uh, I think the company went down the drain since. I don't support Garden of Life. Neo Cell, same thing. Denied the COA. They said they don't get it. I tried DMing them to get a different result. Nothing. Bulletproof, same thing. Flat out denial. They said it's proprietary. Um, they, they gave me some more information, just like the cacao and the protein powder and now the collagen. It's the same thing. Heavy metals are not proprietary. Bulletproof. I'm sorry, Dave Asprey. I wish I could support you, but I can't. All right, check this out. Moon Juice, just like they did with the protein powder. They said, we do not share COAs, so I can't share my support. Zoo Nutrition, same thing. My assistant spoke to them, emailed them twice, never received anything. Primal Kitchen, which was just bought out by Kraft. Um, they said they do not give out the COAs. It's confidential, never responded to either. I wonder when I, if, I, if when I met the CEO at a party and I asked him, he would give me the COA. Unfortunately, the company doesn't do that. So Primal Kitchen, I'm sorry, I don't support you. You got good salad dressing though. Primal Harvest, they said they would uh, send it twice. They never did. Whew. And lastly, Sun Warrior, they said they do not give out that information. I didn't expect it anyway. All right, enough with the negativity. Let's get with the good ones. All right, so I'm gonna make this easy. There's only a few of them that passed the test. There's only a few of them that were transparent and there's only a few of them where the COAs were really clean where I can speak highly of the company. And by a few, I mean three. So I'm assuming that a lot of these companies are gonna get their sales up because these are the best collagens that I found. All right, so Aura Organic. This is the vegan one. The vegan one, and I really like them. Um, in the Knowledge Bomb segment, I spoke of the foods that provide the cofactors and amino acids to support collagen. And this is what their formula is really dense in and it looks like. So they wrote to me um, and I know that they said they, I, we know that most companies withhold COAs and they're actually actively and intentionally doing the opposite. So in their 12 gram scooper powder everything was under proposition 65 regulations really nice clean coa i was really happy to see this like it should be and one of the best parts and most encouraging parts that i heard from the company about aura organic is that they say they're revitalizing revitalizing their website to include in-depth transparency section that publishes all of their coas where you could just go onto the website and see their third-party testing jesus this is how companies should be doing it because transparency is every everything thank you aura organic for really helping us in the public understand better again this is a vegan one not an not a animal collagen, but remember, it gives you the cofactors and amino acids. So I'm actually kind of interested in doing it myself, to be honest. All right, natural force, that's the next one. Natural force uh, was one that I never heard of, but their COA had, and this is an animal one, their COA had the lowest heavy metal count of all animal-based collagen mixtures. Really, really good one. Um, they say that if you go on the website, it says natural, organic, non-GMO. Um, they source grass-fed. Um, and the labels, uh, what I would like to see more so on the labeling for the packages is more information, more certification. So we know the nice thing is it's in a GMP certified facility, which means that it has excessive third party testing. Um, again, the COA though, as a whole, even past heavy metals was clean across the board. So on the surface, if I was someone who ate animal products and I was interested in collagen, this might be one of the ones that I get. And the last one, um, which I got the COA this morning, um, really uh, from this from the CE which was really cool, uh, Native Path. Native Path is the last animal-based one, not vegan one, animal-based one which uh, had really good COA, low heavy metals across the board, um, really conscious company. They source uh, grass-fed bovine. Uh, what I was talking to, I actually got on the phone with the CEO this morning, right before the show actually, and what he was telling me is, He's more of a proponent of using one type of collagen from one animal, or 
and animal collagen, not mixed. So if you think to ancient nutrition, they use different types of animals until so they'll have like marine, bovine, chicken. Um, but he says that it's better absorbed when it's just sole mono um, collagen coming from one source. So uh, yeah, there you go. Look, so summarizing, or organic, natural forest, native path. I wish that I could have gave you 10 of the best, but you know what? Three is better than nothing. There you go, COAs, heavy metals, transparency, support these companies if you do buy collagen. Um, and thank you for tuning in and trusting me to put out this information to you. It really means a lot that I'm able to synthesize and research and you all are out here going, you know what? Like I put a lot of value in that. That means a lot to me. Whew. All right, good deep breath. Now, no, 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 no. I can't even give Jade the proper intro, but I'm gonna tell you, this guy is the OG doing this. He's been at this forever and he's doing it better than almost anyone. I can't wait for you to listen to this interview. Let's get to this segment. All right, everyone, a special, special, special guest. This is my guy and I'm gonna tell you why. Well, I'll tell you the story, but he is a best-selling author. He is the metabolic guru. I look to him when I want to find out more about metabolism and the ins and outs and how sophisticated it is. What a blessing to have him in here. The man, Jay Tita, but I could say Jay Tita because I'm Spanish, <laughs> right? We got I got to stay true to my heritage. My guy. Good to see you, brother. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want to open your uh, segment here with how we met. Yeah. How about you tell the first part, I tell the second part? Yeah. I, I love this story. So... We started following each other through a mutual friend. Who was the mutual friend, by the way? Ralph, I think, Dr. Right, Espo. That's right. So we started following each other th through a mutual friend, and I posted something on my thing that I think maybe rubbed you the wrong way, or maybe it was the, the vice versa. Yeah. And then I think we both unfollowed each other, uh -huh. right? And we're just like, whatever with that guy. Whatever, know, whatever with that whatever, guy. Whatever with that guy. You know yeah. that happens. Yeah. And then we are at an event where we went to the A4M conference. Mm -hmm. And so I come and sit down, and you're sitting next to me, right? And we basically fall in love with each other, not yeah. knowing who each other are. And yeah, then it yeah. dawns on me, yeah, good vibes, like, which is, I love this dude, yeah, and he's, yeah. the, he's the best. And then I'm like, dude, do you remember we actually had a tiff on, on, yeah, and on then, social and then, media? Yeah, and then it hit me. Yeah, the, and then it hit both. The back of my head, we both had the realization, we're like, oh, well, that's a past. Yep. That, and then, yeah, but we, we just started. And I, you know what? I love stories like that too, right? Because it reminded me um, of just keeping an open mind with people. Because you and I come at things slightly differently, mm -hmm. but I've learned so much from you. So like when you tell me, you know, I learned, it's like I've learned so much from you watching your stuff. And you have to, you have to make sure we don't shut down. We humans tend to default to our biases and our prejudices and stuff. Like it's very easy for us to do that, mm -hmm. especially in the social media world. So yeah, man. And then I just feel like I made like a best friend. And so yeah, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I love the connection and I love being able to learn from you. So it was a and fun, vice funny versa. story. Yeah. Vice versa, man. And, and I think you bring up a good point about being open in everything. Yeah. As, and, but for us, it's specifically like the medicine that we're in. And I certainly was more dogmatic years ago than or back then mm -hmm. than I am now because I go, well, damn, there's, not, there's more than one way, huh? Yeah. And learning that there's bio-individuality so much more than I ever thought in people, yeah. that just complicates everything, yeah. but in a good way too because we do different things and approach things differently. Yeah. So um, so your, man, your specialty, and you've been at it for, you're the OG, man. You've been <laughs> at it for quite a while. <laughs> I know, I love it when people tell me that. Right? Like, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm getting old nah, now for sure. Nah, 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 <laughs> you're keeping yourself young, man. You're using your own secrets, but it's really on metabolism. And for folks, let's just start off like metabolism in itself. How would you define it in all of your years of studying now? Yeah. How do you view it? To me, it's very simple. When you, if you start to think about the metabolism, what is it designed for? It's designed for survival and to keep us safe. So if that's the case, what would it be measuring as a result of doing that? Stress. And so to me, the metabolism is not a calculator. It's not a chemistry set. The best way to think about it is one big stress barometer. So what it is doing, it's looking out in the outside world and saying, what is going on in terms of light and temperature, food availability, stress reactivity, and how do I need to respond to that in terms of building muscle or burning fat or keeping myself healthy and regulating my immune system. So if you want to think about the metabolism like a computer, because we all use computers every day, you think about it as the CPU, the software program, mm -hmm. is the hormones that the metabolism uses to do what it does. Once you conceptualize the metabolism that way, you start to understand that it's not what we used to think. 
because I'll give you one example, then I want to see what you think about this, Christian. But here's one example. If you think of the metabolism as a chemistry set or a calculator, then you go, well, if everyone's eating more and exercising less, then we should just eat less mm -hmm. and exercise more. That makes sense if you look at it from a calculator standpoint, just subtract out from all the addition that you've been doing. But if you're looking at it from a stress barometer standpoint, you can see that exercising too much and eating too little is also a stress, just as much as eating more, right? Mm -hmm. And exercising less is a stress. So isn't it funny, by the way, and I'll give you one hint on this and I'll see where you wanna go. If the metabolism is a stress barometer, then how do we measure it? How can we look on the dial and see how much stress we have? Well, the metabolism is actually sending signals to us all the time that tell us in the form of sleep. Are we sleeping appropriately? Or is our sleep fragmented? Is it quality and quantity? Mood, are we too anxious? Are we depressed? Uh, hunger, are we hungry all the time? Energy, is it unpredictable and unstable? Cravings, is it unrelenting and all the time? I call this Schmeck, by the way. Sleep, hunger, mood, mm. energy, and craving, S-H-M-E-C. So if all those things are out of balance, if Schmeck is out of check, it tells you your stress barometer is overloaded. It's registering red. Mm -hmm. So isn't it funny that the couch potato who eats more and exercises less they have Schmeck out of check, but also the person who is exercising like crazy and not eating at all, mm -hmm. their Schmeck is also out of check. And so when you start to conceptualize the metabolism that way, you start realizing, oh, I have to really balance these two things. Going harder and longer and faster and more frequent can be an issue. The same way sitting on the couch and doing nothing can be an issue. Yeah, wow, that spectrum change. And there was that simple old school equation that you gave me, and then you just added all these factors. I went back to like eighth grade arithmetic and I started getting anxious <laughs> because I started seeing X's and Y's in there yep. because you're right. Like nothing is that simple in the body, yeah. but it's pretty incredible. The point that you make that you literally in the ends of the spectrum, you could be on both ends and still in sort of the same boat. Absolutely. And, and it goes with mindset too, right? I mean, you know, we've seen people who go obsessive with diet and exercise and obsessive with health and fitness. That's not healthy. Just like it's not healthy not to care at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's always sort of this balance. And in our world, in the naturopathic medicine world, we kind of get this education sort of from the start, sort of uh, working with the inherent intelligence of the body versus trying to force it to do things. And so as a naturopathic physician, it makes sense to me that the metabolism is just trying to seek balance. And what we need to do is listen to what it's telling us, what's going on with sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. And by the way, not just that kind of stuff, but also exercise performance, exercise recovery. Libido is a big one. Menses for women is another big one that tells you about your stress barometer. And digestion, and also signs and symptoms of disease. All these things are telling us how well the metabolism is balancing out this equation or not. And then we need to work with it. So uh, and just to kind of get into that, when I say work with it, what that means is if you start seeing this as a stress barometer, you start realizing that, okay, if the metabolism is telling me uh, that sleep is off or hunger is off or energy is off, that means that what I'm doing has gone too far. And this is why, by the way, right, like we have clients all the time that they start dieting, let's say, and let's any diet. It could be the paleo diet, a keto diet, a vegetarian diet, a vegan mm -hmm. diet, anything that cuts calories down. And what happens typically in about 7 to 10, maybe 14 days, Schmeck starts going out of check. Sleep, mm -hmm. hunger, mood, energy, and cravings start changing, which tells you very simply that that has now become somewhat of a stress for your system. And all you need to do is balance it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe do some stress-reducing techniques. Maybe add in a little bit of carbs if you've been cutting them out. Maybe mm -hmm. add in a little bit of fat if you've been cutting that out. Mm -hmm. And this tells you how to adjust. It first tells you, here's how your metabolism adju is adjusting. And then it also tells you, here's how you can adjust as a result to keep things going rather than, than binge on you know uh, cafeteria food and burgers and pizza and stuff because you went a little bit too far with the diet. Mm, I see. So instead of doing all this fancy blood tests and biohacking, really we have to listen to our body. You're you're submitting that we just have, are better at understanding, hearing the whispers of our body or the yells of our body sometimes, and yep. that's in the form of sleep, right? What was it? Energy, craving. Yep, sleep, hunger, mood, hunger. energy, cravings hunger, are the big ones. Mm -hmm. And that whole idea, it's kind of a, and, and you know this, but I'll, I'll for the listeners. So yes, yeah, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, but also all the other biofeedback in your body. So if you're someone who deals with migraines 
and the program that you're on is making those migraines worse, then that's an indication your metabolism is not happy and you're moving in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I do think, right, because you and I get all the time, I'm sure you get this where people are like, hey, Jade, I hear you work with hormones. Can I get a whole bunch of hormones tested? And I go, well, yes, you can get your hormones tested, but actually hormones impact quality and quantity of sleep. Hormones impact hunger. Hormones impact mood. Hormones impact energy. Hormones impact cravings, libido, menses, all these things. So to me, when I'm saying schmeck, sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings, I'm actually talking about your hormones. Mm -hmm. Now, you can go get them tested if you want, but I can be a little bit more specific and get you involved being sort of like a metabolic detective if yeah. I can teach you how to read it. That's not to say, like, I don't know, do you have, a, I thought you have an R ring, right? Or do mm -hmm. you, yes. I have one on. So one I, of these 10. So I have one as well. And yeah. so it doesn't mean that we can't um, use some of the new tech to help us along with some more objective measures. So, mm -hmm. you know, you and I will run blood labs. We'll do all kinds of things, Fitbits, calorie, uh, you know, uh, step counters, things like that do a lot for us. But if we don't, if we ignore the signals our own body is giving us, they're not going to be as well, as good. Like, for example, I woke up this morning and looked at my heart rate variability, a measure of sympathetic parasympathetic balance or stress reactivity in the body. It's literally measuring the stress barometer as well. But I'm also going to correlate that with how well I slept, what was my hunger like, what's my mood been like, what's my energy like, did I have cravings yesterday, et cetera. So we can use all these tools, including blood labs and vital signs, along with this subjective feelings mm -hmm. that we have to get a sense of what our metabolism is doing. Very nice. Very nice. I get it now. So you mentioned libido. So you're telling me... Uh, when folks libido is suffering how about people because i've had i remember i had uh, a patient say dr g i've had no libido for the past six months mm, yep are you saying that the the metabolism is completely unhappy with where that person is whether then we investigate are you working out too much are you working out too little absolutely what is your day-to-day -day stress how are you eating yep. to see what's what are the stressors based on the, the schmeck. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny. People don't always talk about this stuff, but I'm glad we do because if we take libido and we take menses and we take erections, right? We take those things. We have to understand, okay, the metabolism is a stress barometer. Why does it care about stress in the first place? Because the metabolism was evolved for millions of years to do what? To help us survive. Survive for what? To reproduce, mm -hmm. right? So the metabolism's main priority is reproduction. And women, it's really interesting here with women, they they are the gender of childbearing and rearing. And so their stress barometer is a little bit more stress sensitive than a man's. And so if they go too far on the eat more, exercise less side of the equation, couch potato, they'll start seeing issues with libido and menses. If they go too far on the other end of the equation where they're, you know, uh, cutting all the calories out and exercising like crazy, guess what? They'll see Same issues thing, with yeah. libido and menses. And that was Same. a patient. That was that patient. She yep. was working out way too much. Exactly. And, and so now we know. And same with men, right? So it's really interesting. I worked a lot with bodybuilders, and I was a bodybuilder back in my day. And what you'll see is you'll see these very lean, fit, muscular guys up on stage, yet they have no libido, and they're not getting erections because they're too lean, right? And so you have this sort of thing here where you go, if you really see the metabolism's dysfunction set deeper in, you'll see that the reproductive uh, capacity starts to go yeah. as well. And to me, that's oftentimes a sign that the stress has gone a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can almost see it like stages. Stage one, you know, maybe hunger, energy, and cravings start to be an issue. Stage two, now add sleep and mood onto that. Stage three, all of a sudden libido and menses mm. and erections start to be impacted. And stage four, that's when they show up at yours and my clinics and are like, I have Hashimoto's or I've got, uh, you know, thyroid issues yeah. or I've got an immune condition. Mm -hmm. And now we're dealing with, you know, metabolic disease. So the first part of that stage one, I call metabolic compensation. Mm -hmm. It's hunger, energy and cravings start to be disrupted. That's pretty easy to deal with. All you have to do is do something different, right? So if you've been eating less and exercising more, just eat more and exercise less. Mm -hmm. Or I would say eat more and exercise more or eat less and exercise less. In other words, don't try to match the calorie intake. But compensation is relatively easy to deal with. Stage two, I would call metabolic resistance. This is where a lot of people are starting to hit plateaus and nothing is changing. 
Here, you kind of have to jump back and forth, right? So you kind of got to go, well, I'll be an athlete for maybe a week or two, and then I'll be a Parisian for a week or two Mm -hmm. and just walk and rest and then train and eat and then walk and rest and then train and eat and bouncing back and forth. This works good for women, by the way, with menses because they can do it two weeks, the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle. They maybe can eat more and exercise more like an athletic female. And maybe the last two weeks as they approach menses, they can take it easy and rest. But that's a good way to toggle yourself off of metabolic resistance. But once you start getting into metabolic dysfunction and metabolic disease, where we're starting to see libido and erections and menstrual cycles disappearing and also signs and symptoms and diagnoses, that's when you have to come see someone like me and Mm -hmm. you, and you know, where we uh, begin to institute some things that will jumpstart the metabolism back. Right, right. And, and how many Americans are on that stage, the end stage one before metabolic disease? I would say probably way more than our, our stage one. Absolutely, I would agree with you. Right, that's the that's the way we approach life. Yep, you know we're supposed to be stressed. We're supposed to keep going. Yep, and and I think the it, to to just address that piece there, which is huge. And I know you talk about this a lot. You know, I've learned you know watching you and your teachings, you talk about this a lot. But this idea of the quality of things that we're doing in our life. So you to me, you talk a lot about very importantly the quality of foods that we choose the way we eat, the way we address stress management, all of these kinds of things. This is so important for balancing out this stress barometer because ultimately what a lot of people do, the average American goes, I need to eat and exercise. That's really all they really care about when they think about metabolism. Mm -hmm. I call that meals and metabolics. Metabolics being they want to stimulate the metabolism and meals all about what they eat. So they're like, I'll stimulate the metabolism with supplements or drugs or exercise, and I'll just try to eat the right thing. And Mm -hmm. so they're going meals and metabolics, meals and metabolics. Well, there's two other M's that you talk an awful lot about that are more important. And that is mindset slash mindfulness and movement. And those two things are more important because they take the stress off the system. And so when I say mindfulness and movement, what I mean is mindfulness, I mean sleep and naps. I mean, sex and physical affection. I mean, time with pets. I mean, uh, leisurely walking. I mean, massage and meditation. Mm -hmm. I mean, creative pursuits. Like one of the things we now know that if painting and coloring and all these things lower stress hormones, uh, the Japanese use what's called Shinrin Yoku, which means bathing in the forest, bathing in green, all these things that reduce stress. And then also understanding that movement, walking, is different than metabolics. Movement is something that we require, we must do. Our, our systems evolved with moving. We're not built to run, but we are built to walk. And walking has a simultaneous lowering effect with insulin and cortisol, the two hormones most likely to disrupt our stress barometer. Mm-hmm. And so when I think of metabolism, I think these four things, mindfulness, movement, meals, and metabolics. And what you and I see most of the time that gets people in trouble, they're just meals and metabolics, meals and metabolics, meals and metabolics. And I'm like, uh, you're missing the two most important critical elements, mindfulness and movement. And when you put those in place, then not only can you eat better naturally, um, but your exercise also begins to do better for you because you're mm-hmm. also recovering. Because yeah, that's recovering, the whole, better prepared huge. for that. Yeah, yep. exactly. Man, I wish you seen me in the middle of undergrad. I was just meals and metabolics. I was on mm-hmm. bodybuilding.com. I was like, all right, <laughs> how can I get my whey protein in? And then how can I do this heavy workout? Yep. Who cared about mindset, right? Yep. Who cared about even movement? I was sitting in a classroom and went straight back home, play video games. The, the, the craziest thing is that those pieces, it's funny, we, we're more than machines. I think the the uh, Im- implication was that we are machines with those two, but when you look at it as a whole, yeah, of course we need mindset. Yep. Of course we need movement. Yeah. This is how we evolve with all those things. So you're telling me folks who consider all four are going to keep are, keep themselves from going into metabolic disease? Is that what you're saying? Those are like the, the big pillars? Absolutely, I would say that, you know, especially those who are uh, over-exercisers, right? Like, you know, you and I deal with that a lot because we, we, you and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I bet you, you see this too. We, you and I haven't spoken about this yet, but I, my bet is you're the same. I feel like I tend to see two types of people. One is the standard American who's just eating everything in sight and sitting around. And then two, the health obsessed, mm-hmm. health crazed, over exerciser, under eater. Mm-hmm. These are the two people that I see all the time. And they are both only focused in those two areas. So once you balance that out, 
with, hey, you need to recover and lower stress and take stress off that system. And you do need to move, but appropriately, all of a sudden things begin to balance out. And we were talking just before the show that I'll, I'll let people in on a thing, uh, a little secret here. A lot of times people think with the metabolism, they think that they want to stimulate it or they want a fast metabolism. You do not want a fast metabolism. You want a flexible metabolism. The reason why is because anytime you try to speed up the metabolism, you also speed up hunger and cravings, which is why a lot of people struggle. And so we really want to be thinking about balancing this out, which you and I come from a training and a background that is all about balance. And so that framework of meals, metabolics, movement, and mindfulness really creates the balance that the metabolism needs to balance out that stress barometer. Mm -hmm. It's hugely important. So yes, I would say once people put those in play, things become a whole lot easier. I mean, I don't know if you've heard this, Christian, but I hear this all the time. People go, Jade, I'm doing everything right, everything right, and I'm not changing. I'm not losing weight. And as soon as I go through these four M's, I realize, yeah, you're doing everything right maybe with meals and metabolics, mm -hmm. at least you think you are. You don't even realize that mindfulness and movement is equally, if not more important. Mm. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Everyone wants to stimulate their metabolism, mm -hmm. right? They want to go, oh, no, you know, I want to boost up my metabolism. But if you have those pillars that you said, and then you're listening to the schmeck part, then you already have the tools for you to overall do better with your overall metabolism, right? Keep yep. it in balance and then hit your goals, let's say. And you're right, man. I, it's, it's funny because um, we have the folks, you're, you're right about the patients I saw, we have the folks who are doing nothing and really sick, mm. and then the ones who are super into fitness and working out, and they're like, oh, I should have a naturopathic doctor. I want to mm. optimize. Yep, yep. It's funny because those people who want to optimize, they don't know that they have so much more to do. Yeah, absolutely. Right, because they're focusing on the, as we mentioned, the, the, the two, the, mo the most popular ones that people focus on yeah. instead of looking at mindfulness and movement. Yeah. So um, I love that. So you d I know you love mindset. I, I go through your page and I see every other post is a mindset. You have these little prescription pads with mindset messages, <laughs> which are so original. And I love that. Yeah. I love seeing it on my feed. Um, I am one to say that it's, it's, it's huge. And you mentioned that. What are some pillars for your how you approach mindset and why is it so important? Yeah. Well, you know, this is where you and I, I think this is where uh, I got my man crush on you. We started talking about the idea that part of our success, like you and I have had maybe more success than a lot of people who do what we do. You know, yeah. nature paths tend to go into clinical careers and you and I have been able to sort of move into te more of a teaching role. Yeah. And so when I think of mindset, I think of that exactly. What happens is when you and I, when I was talking to you, my, I was immediately struck by the fact that you understand very clearly your purpose and that you clearly chose your purpose. And I believe that we have a pandemic, an epidemic pandemic of lack of purpose because people, again, just like they don't understand metabolism, they also don't understand purpose. And this is what, you know, and I think you will totally vibe with me on this because I know you feel this way. But to me, the biggest thing that I can say with mindset is that purpose is not something that we find. We don't stumble across it. It's not something we go like, you know, maybe it's over there or maybe it's over there. It's something that we choose very consciously. And it comes from, you know, I always think in, I always think in uh, you know, frameworks, right? So I have a framework for purpose as well. It comes from our um, signature strengths, talents, things that we developed over the years. I call them our powers, right? Because these are, these are all the P's, the five P's of purpose. It also comes from people, the people that we're exposed to. It comes from our perceptions, the way that we think um, about sort of the world. Most importantly, though, it comes from our, um, our pain and the things that we are exposed to. And then the last P is our passions, what we're interested in. So, But I want to talk about this, this pain thing for just a minute, and then I want to see your take on this because I know you love this stuff. So if, if purpose is these things, our passions, our perceptions, our superpowers, our pains and the people that we're exposed to. What I'm saying is our pain as humans. If there's one thing I know about all of you listening to this and watching this and every, and what I know about you, Christian, and mm -hmm. you all know about me, is that you have deep wounds and hurt. Mm -hmm. 
I know that because you're human, I'm human. We know that we have that. Now, here's what we do mindset-wise. We tend to treat those wounds like, um, well, I'll give you an example of this but real quick, if you don't mind. But here, here's how I liken it. Imagine you and I are in the kitchen. We're hanging out, and we're cutting carrots and, and celery. And my knife slips, and I, I cut my thumb. Now, the normal response to that would be what? For me to cover it, ah, mm -hmm. like that, look at it, and make sure, see how deep it is, do I need stitches or not, and then go wash it and tend to it. With our emotional wounds, instead we do this. You're standing there and I go, ow, ow, and I shove my thumb in your face and just start screaming ow at you. Mm -hmm. Ow, 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 as if Christian is responsible for that. Like, and I'm not gonna tend to it unless Christian does. That's one reaction we have to our pain. Mm -hmm. The other reaction is we just sit there and stare at the thumb and whimper and cry and do nothing about it. Yeah. The third reaction would be we stick it behind our back and we just hide and, it. And, we yeah. just hide it. Mm -hmm. and this is, it sounds ridiculous because we would never do that with a physical wound. But that's what we do with our mental, emotional wounds, the stuff that has happened to us over the course of our lives. And to me, pain is actually a path to purpose. In other words, when you own your pain and you tend your pain and you look at the lessons that your pain is trying to teach you, you realize that maybe, maybe, and I don't know what your belief is. My, I don't really have a belief in God or anything like that. I just... I have a belief in uh, my ability to choose and create. That's my major belief. But I believe that pain gives me lessons that point me directly to what I might teach, right? And so to me, pain informs me. And then I choose. I'm going to teach on health because I had some health care issues. I'm going to teach on people how to heal from romantic loss because I had romantic loss. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, my favorite example of this is I'm a child of the 80s and back in the 80s, anyone who's a child of the 80s remembers sitting there drinking, uh, eating their, their Cheerios or Fruit Loops and they would look and see, not Fruit Loops, man, uh, whatever a healthy cereal is, but mm -hmm. <laughs> looking at their milk carton and they would see oh, so uh, missing, missing kid. kids, yeah. right? And that those missing kids were put on those milk cartons because of a mom who had her child kidnapped, raped, and murdered. The most horrible thing that can happen to a mother, but she turned that pain into her purpose and saved tens of thousands of, of kids as a result of that from that campaign, or thousands of kids, however many it is. And that's my point about mindset. So when you ask me about the mindset aspect of this, and then you might say, well, how did we get off metabolism? I go... Our pain is the most important aspect of that. And once we own that pain, instead of trying to put it off on someone else or hiding it, it informs us about why we're trying to be healthy in the first place or why we are um, you know, searching for love in the first place or why we want to have money in the first place, right? You and I talked about this at dinner and we were both like, yeah, we are people who want an abundant life. We're also people who want to be very generous. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. As teachers... We need money to teach. All this stuff here that we're doing right now costs mm -hmm. money, right? So Christian has to make money to do all of this to touch his individuals. And so to me, that's why mindset is so critical. It's not separate from, in fact, it is the underlying soil that uh, grows our, you know, sort of uh, crops as, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And we ignore it. And, mm -hmm. and we don't uh, pay any attention to it. So I'm interested, I'm talking a lot, I'm interested in your thought on that, and hopefully everyone followed me, but it's every bit as important. I see it as a spiritual fingerprint. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, and we need to find this why, I guess is the popular sort of term now. I just think people miss it because they think they find it. No, you create it, and how do you create it? You create it from those five Ps, but most importantly, your pain. Yeah, what? Well, that was so eloquently and beautifully and poetically said, man. That's the truth, and the way you tied it in into the pain is important because we um, love to see things as good and bad, and that's it, mm -hmm. right? That's our binary approach to life. Um, so automatically, if anything hurts us, it's automatically bad. Yep. So that's what we do. We have those three mechanisms, like you said. I'm going to yell at you, or mm -hmm. I'm just going to stare at my pain for years, or I'm going to hide it, which is what sometimes. A lot of men do, I know. Yep, I notice. Absolutely. But instead, what you're submitting to the audience, and I am too, is to utilize that pain for your own right. And understand, I've attracted this person, place, thing, situation, or circumstance exactly for this experience, 
for me to learn exactly that which I need to learn yeah. or create, yeah. right? And you use the word create a few times, and that's one of the most important things for me is when you say create, it empowers you as a person, as the creator, right? So aside from any theological or uh, uh, you know omnipotent approach or anything mm -hmm. like that, what we can do is say, yeah, we have the power to create and choose. Yeah. And choosing is so amazing. And that's what you said. You can choose where you want to go with whatever. And for me, there's no right or wrong. Yeah. It's like, I can choose to stare at my pain for the rest of my life and I die. Great. That was the, my legacy. Yeah. Or, you know, at 35 years old, I can go, damn, this pain has been messing me up. What can I choose differently today? Yeah. And then that new choice creates a new vibration and a new reality and a new circumstance. Everything just shifts. And you felt that shift before. I know you have in, mm -hmm. in love, in money, in, in health, in, in business. Yeah. And um, that's literally where we were vibing because we're like, oh yeah, this is... You, he you gets don't, it. That yeah, was... you don't meet a lot of people who speak the same yeah. language. And actually, here's a, here's a way to tie this home to go back to the analogy of cutting vegetables and cutting your finger. Think about what you do in that. Not only do you mend it, but if you're smart, you don't stay out of the kitchen. You actually learn better knife skills. You mm -hmm. become more careful with the knife and you actually learn to use the knife better. And that's essentially what I'm saying here. If you get hurt in love, you learn to be better with that. If you get hurt with finances, you get better with that. And here's the part that will really mess with everybody. But what if we're sitting in the kitchen and instead of me cutting myself, Christian reaches over and cuts me with his knife, right? What am I going to do then? Regardless of who did it, I still am the one who has the wound. I still have to mend it, right? I still have to go through the same process. Now, I might put up boundaries and be like, I'm not going to hang out with Christian if he's going to cut my finger. But in the end, I have to deal with that. Blaming and complaining don't do anything for me. In fact, they're spiritually degrading. But what I love that you said was, okay, this just happened to me. Here's the thing that I think a next level human does. They don't go, this happened to me. Let me go complain about it, blame about it, cry about it. They go, this happened to me. This is horrible. It hurts. I'm not going to deny that. But how do I happen back? Mm -hmm. How do I get to happen back? Life happens. I get to happen back. So I go like this. There's a saying. I love distinctions. There's a saying that everyone has. Everything happens for a reason, right? I don't like that saying because it takes my power away. I like the saying better that things happen and I get to choose a reason, right? I love that saying because you do that to me and then I can go, huh, I, why did this happen? Maybe I go into a whole thing about you know teaching other people how to avoid people who wound them or how to have better boundaries or how to protect themselves. Maybe that becomes my whole life's purpose being that. So I would say to everyone listening, think about your deepest pains, your deepest wounds, then think about your superpowers and your passions and the people you were exposed to and the way you've thought about the world. Look at all of those together and go, how am I uniquely suited with my unique spiritual fingerprint to serve the world, right? Because to me, this is where I think meaning and purpose are two different things. Meaning, I can get meaning from mine and your friendship. I can get meaning from my lover. I can get meaning from a sunset, right? But when you're gone, my lover's gone, and the sunset sets, meaning goes away, so it's borrowed. Purpose is something that I generate from within me that, I, that gets to flow out to the world. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about purpose, I think about how do I make a difference and matter to the world with my unique strengths in a way that no one else can hear me. You know, you and I teach a lot of the same kinds of things. We have some of the same backgrounds. But there are people, you and I could teach the exact same thing. We could both get up on stage and say the exact words and do, teach the exact same thing. And some people are just going to be like, Christian, I just love him. He's amazing. Other people are going to be like, I can't stand him. Like, I just don't <laughs> vibe with him. I come up and they go, oh, I love Jade. Or mm -hmm. they go, I can't stand him with that bald head and that, you know, big bulky body or whatever it is, right? And so to me, that's what I am. I think people need to um, sort of understand about purpose. And then if to draw it back to healthcare, think about it like this. Once you get that, then being healthy and fit stops being about what do my abs look like and starts being more about how does me being healthy and fit um, serve my purpose? For me, I go, I teach a lot of this stuff. I want to help people 
um, get better in the four jobs, which are, you know, finance and uh, relationships and purpose and meaning and health and fitness. And me being healthy and fit uh, serves that purpose, mm-hmm. makes me a better teacher, gives me energy so I can teach and project. It gives me energy so I look the part. And so now I'm just like, I don't really care if you think I have a nice body or abs or I'm attractive. Mm-hmm. That's a very sort of culture level way of looking at it. My next level self goes, how does me being healthy and fit serve me when I'm out teaching. That's the difference. That's purpose in my mind. Yeah. And the the most interesting part, and really what I say with patients is like, what is one thing I should do? I'm like, reflect, have that own self time, that me time, because what that does is that you create, you start creating a relationship with yourself, understanding yourself, Mm -hmm. forgiving others, understanding your experiences that you had throughout life. So then the dominoes fall because all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I kind of, I kind of like love this spirit of mine. I love this purpose that I found. Well, I actually love my body now too. Let me go to the start going to the gym. Let me start eating better. Those dominoes fall once you have that love and purpose and that fire under you. Yeah. But I'm glad that you spoke about all of this because man, I have so many people ask me, well, how do I find my purpose? What do, what am I doing? Because most of us here in America and throughout the world are not living our purpose. No. But certainly in America, the way it's structured, we're in a cubicle in a job that we just happened to go to because at the health fair in college, that sounded the most interesting. Yeah. But imagine living that life. We're so much more powerful and so much more gifted as human beings here in this quick snap of a finger life yeah. um, to do much more with it. So, yeah. And you can feel someone who's living their purpose, right? You can. It, it's, it's an energy coming off of it. And I'll, I'll say one thing just briefly about that because I think it's powerful. My father, okay, he chose at some point, he's a blue collar guy, you know, just came up his, his job. Many people think like you and I get to our job is our purpose. We're Mm -hmm. lucky in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I feel it off you when I I meet you and you feel it off me that we're Mm -hmm. living our purpose. However, if you meet my father, he hated his job. You could still feel he was living his purpose. He chose father from an early age. And as a result, when he had, he woke up, basically had, you know, four kids and he asked, you know, my mom, his wife and said, what do you, you want out of life? She goes, I want all my kids to go to college. So he made that his job to be a good father. He didn't think that his job had to be fulfilling. His job uh, basically financed his purpose of raising us kids. However, here's, here's the interesting thing about that. Here's where meaning crosses over into purpose. As his kids, it's meaningful. It was really meaning, but once he decided to be a coach and a father to other people, that's when he really started living his purpose. So he took in several of my um, uh, cousins who were having difficulty. He became a coach. He, he started to be a father to other people. And that's when it really started to manifest. So the reason I'm going through this is if you're sitting there being like, well, how do I um, find my purpose? Well, you don't. You create it. And then secondly, you don't make the mistake that your job is your purpose. Sometimes your job will finance your purpose. And your purpose may simply be showing up as the father or the mother or the teacher or the healer in the area of your influence. And the final thing I'll say about purpose, and I want to see what you think about this, is the following. In the end, what purpose is, purpose is something that flows from you to the outside world. If you have expectation and assumptions about needing to be acknowledged or to get reciprocation back, you're not actually living your purpose. Because when you're in deep purpose, there is no, tell me I'm beautiful, tell me I'm wonderful, tell me I'm doing great things. It's enough to do the thing. And that's how you know you're deeply aligned. Yeah. That validation just goes. Yep. And and what what a good barometer, right? Like, am I being validated for doing this? Am I looking for validation from people closest to me or even people who are, you know, just watching from the outside or truly are you flowing where you're in your own flow state, you're in your own present state. And if you hear it, this is what I notice: mm. when people give that validation for, I love your show and this is that I hear it, but it doesn't stick. It just flows. I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't stick. It, love it. it doesn't change. It's not a source of self-identity yeah. or self-identification. Yeah. It's really interesting. You say it because I found the same thing too. Criticisms and compliments hit me the same way now. Mm -hmm. They basically, I just go, I'm doing my thing and I'm human. So they certainly can have transient effects on me, but they don't stick on me. Like you said, it's really interesting. So you're like, Jade, you're doing great. Thanks. 
Jade, you, you're horrible. I hate you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so that little tiff went right through you yeah. a few years ago, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Right I mean, through, it yeah. hits you briefly, right? Yeah. And then you're right on. And I bet you for you too, same yeah. exact thing. Hits you briefly and then you're right on Just sort of keep doing going your thing. With life. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, uh, man, you're, I, I, we need more uh, doctors out there who understand the body as a whole. But the mindset, man, 2020 is... Are we even looking at physical anymore? It is mindset so powerfully because yeah. that the big domino is falling. And the physical is coming with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. How many times I've had someone in there, I'm like, listen, you've had the best protocol. You've eat, you eat the best, you work out, you sleep well, but you still have this. Well, you, don't, you didn't really fix that relationship with your lover mm -hmm. or a scorn lover or a father or mother. And when they make that breakthrough, it's, it's crazy to see even skin diseases go away. Christian, it's amazing. I've seen the same thing. And that's why I've started saying uh, the Stoic philosophy, I, I'm, I am big into philosophy, but the Stoics have a saying, the obstacle is the way. And I, have, I, I, I say it like this, your pain is your path and your suffering is your source. Meaning that I don't care if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to heal, whatever you're trying to do, go and look at that pain, find where it is, those things that have happened to you and realize that what if... I don't know. Just try it on for size. What if you got exactly what was needed so that you could realize something that got you to your next level self? Mm -hmm. And by you ignoring your suffering, hiding your hurt, uh, not owning your pain, and expecting someone else to fix it, and blaming and complaining, what if that is the very thing keeping you from where you're trying to get? And mm -hmm. I believe that it is. Mm -hmm. Obstacles to healing, yep. obstacles to curing, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and what I'll say is this one last thing is that when I understood that things are for me, even the worst things are for me, like let's say I, I bought a brand new puppy, I fell in love with that puppy, it got run over by a drunk driver. I, even at the, the humanistic level, like I'm angry, I'm sad, but there's still always the underlying thing that this is my secret. My underlying thing is it's for me. Yeah. So because it's for me, I'm like, well, I'm creating it. I'm attracting it. What, why, what's here? What is it here for? So I always question every human pace, person, place, thing, situation, circumstance as to why it's here in my life. So what more empowered we become when we say that, when we go, okay, I can utilize this experience to shift that vibe, to create from from a new, like an alchemist, yeah. from a new I can create. So that's beautiful, man. So um, a, f a few quick things before we end this, and I don't even want to end it, to be honest. Yeah, so we, we got to have you back. I know you live yeah. pretty close yeah, to yeah. here. So, okay. Um, for our, what are... What are forest fires? What are, what what is what are things in our lives, whether mental or or food wise or alcohol or something? What messes with our mindset and metabolism? Mm. What is what what are the things that you're like? You've got to stay away from this stuff. Yeah, to me, to me, it's the junk. Okay, and so the junk is usually things um, that you don't need and get in the way. So, for example, if we're talking metabolism. These are what I would call the cafeteria foods, the combinations of salt and sugar and fat and alcohol that hijack our brains and, and move us away from our vital selves, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was going to say everyone is different, but this is what you and I kind of share, that these cafeteria foods of these combinations of all these macronutrients and high flavor profiles literally hijack our, our brains and make our schmecka go out of check. This is a forest fire. You want to stay away from this stuff as much as you possibly can because very few of us, some of us can, but very few of us can do a cheat meal or reward meal and not have it turn into a cheat week or a cheat month, right? So these kind of things we need to be aware about, it, aware of. And the same thing happens when you look at the mindset aspect of things. Um, but one more physical aspect is too much physical stuff or too little physical stuff, right? So you don't want, you know, CrossFit and yoga and running and all of this kind of stuff. That too is like junk on mm -hmm. top of you. You want enough, but not too much. Goldilocks is what we're trying to do. Balance the Tao, learn to get into the flow. Same thing with, um, with uh, the mindset aspect of things. We want to uh, avoid this idea. And we know just like Schmeck in check for the, for the metabolism, for the mindset, you want to be thinking about anxiety and depression and mood jumping sort of all over the place. This means you are being, you're exposing yourself to the wrong people, the wrong passions, 
You're, you're not in touch with your powers. You're hiding your pain. All those, your, think, your perceptions are wrong. Mm -hmm. So all those things I talked about with purpose. So that's how I would say um, you want to be sort of balancing this out. I always look at it like, you know, it's uh, my Bruce Lee uh, is, is a philosopher and he's also the actor and martial artist. But he has this thing that he says, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, add what is uniquely your own. Okay. Most people are not doing that. They're just letting all this stuff sort of fall on them. And so what I would say is that's how you cut through the clutter. That's mm -hmm. how you cut through the cafeteria foods and the too much exercise and the too much information and the too much mindset stimulation from all these things. You start to go, what is it about me that is unique? How do I take what I can use and learn from, to your point? Also, what do I need out of my life, whether mm -hmm. it's boundaries with people or I can't do gluten, you know, I, I need to get rid of certain things. And then what are the things that I know that I bring to the table that I absolutely have to have? You know, like one of the things for me, we were just talking before I came in here, it's like, I'm going to go after this in sauna and a contrast hydro because it's one of the things that I have that calms me. For other people, it's Tai Chi. For other people, it's, you know, taking a nap. But mm -hmm. we need to understand what these things are. So yeah. that's how I would see managing these, these sort of forest fires. I love that. Because we're all starting forest fires, whether we know it or not. Yep. Um, sometimes purpose, you know, sometimes purposefully going into that cheat meal mm -hmm. and going, all right, well, you know what? I had a hard week. I'm going to eat it. But then it can turn into a whole week and then yep. the whole mindset part. Um, all right. So you have um, a book out. What's the name of it? Yeah, my new book is a mindset book. It's a daily read. Very much if you if you dug the whole conversation about pain as the path and suffering as the source, the book is called Human 365, mm -hmm. and it's basically a daily read that teaches you this sort of idea around um, using pain as a path and suffering as a source. And some of the stuff that you and I have learned in our lives naturally that we've talked about, mm -hmm. um, that book is a, a, a really cool book. And it's my second self-development book. I normally write in metabolism. So I'm really proud of that one. And it's, I, like the, I, I like the idea of the daily read. I've been getting good feedback. So Human 365, that's on Yeah, Amazon. I love that. And then your first book was, or the, the, the big one was. Yeah, my first book back in the day was The Metabolic Effect mm -hmm. Diet. That's 20, 2010, and that book's still that crazy? selling well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't that crazy? I know. I remember when we were out and the, you know one of our friends was like, oh, wait, I just hit me. I read that in school. That yeah, was yeah, you. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, well... I'm with a celebrity over here. <laughs> we got. We're gonna get your autograph over uh, a little bit later. Um, where do we find you on Instagram or website? Where? Yeah, the best place to find me is you know I hang out on Instagram like you do mm -hmm. at Jade Tita on Instagram, and then uh, uh, my website is jadetita.com. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And no one took that domain. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's unique. And, and then, then, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thank you, my friend. I mean, like oh. honestly, I, I've, been, I've loved this friendship. I love learning from you. Thank you for uh, hanging out with me, and thanks to everyone for watching. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going to find a more authentic guy. I really appreciate you, Jade. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We learned so much. I learned so much. Go out and get that book. Learn more from the guru. All right, everyone. Thank you. Love you, brother. I told you Jade would be amazing. This, this is my guy. This is why he's like a guru to me. Not only is he engaging, captivating, but so intelligent. I love those uh, mnemonics that he uses and uh, or the acronyms. And uh, I learned a lot and I hope you did too. So thank you for joining the show. Wait till next week. I already got the show done next week. I can't wait. Thank you so much for rating, reviewing, subscribing. I love you all. Have a wonderful week. Go hug someone that you love. Thank you.